good. Attorney General Cuomo, just want you to know that uh, you kind of get used to this type of reception when you're the mayor of Jamestown, walking in front of a beautiful crowd on a beautiful Saturday morning like this. Uh, I have the best job in the world this morning and the most difficult job in the world this morning. The best part of the job is I get to welcome our distinguished guests to the great Pearl City of New York State. I also get to introduce a very good friend of mine to follow me up to this podium. The most difficult job that I have in the world today is making sure that everybody in this crowd of acknowledgeables get acknowledged. And why don't we just start out by uh, calling attention to the folks that have allowed us to use their beautiful house here today. Uh, Greg Peterson, Adam Bratton, and Carol Drake from the Robert H. Jackson Center. former county executive, one of the best county executives that we've ever seen here, one of the best chief executive officers that we've ever seen in this county, and now the regional director of the state uh, parks department, Mark Thomas and his wife Elaine. We have several local officials, and what I'm going to do is just call them out by name, and if you can give them all a collective round of applause. Uh, we have county legislator Paula DeJoy. City Councilman at Large George Spitali, City Council Member Paul Whitford, City Council Member and also Vice Chair of the Chautauqua County Democratic Committee and City Chairman of the City Democratic Committee Vince DeJoy. Uh, we have former County Legislator Joe Trusso. Uh, we have our 57th 
Senatorial District Candidate Mike McCormick. We have our candidate for the 150th Assembly District, uh, Nancy Barger. Uh, former Assemblyman Raleigh Kidder. Raleigh's back here and the former chairman of the uh, Robert Jackson Center, Executive Director. We have our County Sheriff, Joe Girassi. Joe, where are you? And Joe's family that is going to make sure that even as the results of the 2010 census comes in, New York State is able to maintain 29 congressional districts. Joe, thanks for doing such a good job. And that we keep one upstate as well here. Now, with all of that, how are we doing this morning? Good morning. Let's hear it. Come on, guys. We can do better than that. The AG and the next governor of New York State just traveled all across this state, all 49,108 square miles of it to land in Jamestown. We can do better than that. How are we doing this morning? Many of you have heard me say before, and I want to say it again, that the best man that I ever knew spent his entire adult life trying to impress upon his three children a few simple principles. The first one was serve others and not yourself. The second message was work hard and do big things in your life. Big things that are going to help and touch other people's lives in a positive way and big things that are going to go far beyond your time in this place. And the third premise that this man that I absolutely adored tried impressing on his three children every day of his life was, it's not about what you accomplish in your lifetime. It's about what you inspire others to accomplish during theirs. He did this every day of his life, not through the poetry of his words, but the simple eloquence of the way that he lived his life each and every day. There are two people here today, one that I have the pleasure and the honor of welcoming to our great city, and the other that I have the honor of bringing up to this podium, who I know, and I know that they are the living embodiment of those three principles. The first gentleman is somebody that I've only known on a personal basis for about five years now. But I feel that I've known him as a personal friend my entire life. He comes from a family whose name is synonymous with public service, selfless public service and sacrifice. He has spent his entire life with the considerable education and talents that he had that could have been appropriated in one of a hundred different areas, making personal profit for himself and contributing in other ways, he's made the decision instead to commit himself to public service and serving others. He's done things throughout his entire life because it's in his DNA. It is who he has been, who he is today, and who he will be when he's sworn in on January 1st as the 56th governor of the state of New York doing big things with his time in this place. As Assistant Secretary and then Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, taking a federal agency that was completely wrecked and turning it into an efficient point of pride and helping people, those that need help in our country, getting decent housing and rebuilding rotting cores of urban areas all over the country. He spent his time as Attorney General of this great state out there fighting on behalf of people that need government's help and protection. He embodies the words of another great governor, no, not the 52nd governor, but another governor from many years ago in which he said, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those that have much, it's whether we truly help and provide enough for those who have too little. That was Governor Roosevelt back in the 1920s. Our Attorney General, our next Governor, understands this. And he also understands a thing or two about the third principle, the third principle of inspiring others. In a very few minutes, we're all going to be inspired up here. But Andrew Cuomo, most importantly, a guy that has his priorities straight in life, has spent the last 15 years of his life teaching and nurturing 
and inspiring the three most important people in the world to him, his daughters that are here with us today. The other gentleman that I referred to is somebody that truly is a lifelong friend of mine, actually close to a lifelong friend. I've told the story before in Stan's presence. Stan and I actually met officially for the first time in October of 1971. Stan was the 31-year-old mayor of Jamestown at that time, who was running in his first re-election campaign. I was an 11-year-old sixth grade student in Audrey Shannon's class at M.J. Fletcher Elementary School in the south side of town, and Mayor Lundeen came to our classroom. It was the thrill of my life at that time, and as I look back on it, it was a pivotal point in my life because it actually inspired me into seeking a path in public service. We had a little campaign going on at the time, and Stan, whether you realize it or not, I was your campaign manager at Fletcher School in 1971. His opponent came a couple of weeks earlier, and uh, he received a modest reception in the room. And when Stan came into the room two weeks later, every wooden desk had a Lundeen for Mayor bumper sticker attached to the front of it. And Stan, I think you won Mrs. Shannon's class with only one dissenting vote that year. I remember that as if it was yesterday, not only because I got a chance to meet the mayor, I could have been meeting the president, I didn't care at the time. This was Stan Lundeen coming to our classroom. But I also had to spend the next two nights scraping all those bumper stickers <laughs> off the front of every wooden desk. With that, I'd like to bring to the microphone our past lieutenant governor, congressman, and most importantly, one of the best mayors this city's ever had, my friend, our friend, Stan Lundeen. that the general election was as easy as Fletcher School. <laughs> Not quite. But uh, thanks very much, Sam. He's a great mayor, and we're proud of him and proud of the leadership that he's provided to this city. You know, I get people coming up to me frequently these days saying, um, New York is really in trouble. And I tell them, it's not as bad as you think. It's worse. And I spent eight years uh, involved with state policy. I'm so grateful to Governor Cuomo for the opportunity that he gave me uh, to do that. But the debt and deficit and the highest property taxes in the nation are, are crippling our state. And our upstate economy generally is struggling. Andrew, you'll be pleased to know that our manufacturing economy in the Jamestown area is doing pretty well. But it's a struggle. You have to run hard every day just to stay even in, in this kind of a situation. And this is only part of the story. We need reform in this state, and we need it very badly. And in order to achieve reform, we need extraordinary leadership. And I, I believe that uh, Andrew is the right person at the right time to provide that leadership. <laughs> this is really a great state, and one of the advantages that I had as lieutenant governor was traveling all around the state. I have a couple of friends from Brooklyn here. And my mom and dad actually lived in Brooklyn before I was born, so I used to say I was made in Brooklyn. <laughs> but I, of course, grew up in, in Jamestown. And, but I got to know the, what great potential this entire state has. But we need reform and we need revitalization. Andrew Cuomo has been a great Attorney General. I will tell you just one aspect that is important to me. As I mentioned, we have extraordinarily high real property taxes, and it's hurting our upstate economy, and it's hurting the entire state. And as you know, I, I chaired a commission and made a lot of recommendations, most of which are on the shelf. 
hopefully they'll be taken off the shelf. But one person came forward and said, I'm going to put my staff to work and we're going to make a proposal. And Andrew Cuomo did, and he got reform through the state, which makes it easier to consolidate and make greater efficiency in local government. And I thank you for that, and uh, I think the state can thank you for that. But that's not the only, as Attorney General, that's not the only thing that uh, Andrew Cuomo has done uh, with great distinction. As Sam mentioned, he was a terrific uh, HUD secretary. And prior to that, he founded a not-for-profit organization called HELP that did some great work in housing. And since I'm on the board of the Robert Jackson Center, I'll say it's important that we have a governor who understands the potential of not-for-profit organizations. And Andrew Cuomo is from the South. He's our best hope for a brighter future, and it's terrific to see uh, the three young Cuomo women here with him today. It's been quite a while since I've seen them and, and they've grown uh, and, and are really terrific to be with him and a part of this uh, campaign. And now I want to introduce Mariah Kennedy Cuomo. Governor Lindeen. Hello, my name is Mariah, and thank you for having us here in Jamestown today. The Governor of New York has to have the knowledge, experience, compassion, vision, and right plan in order to succeed. My father, Andrew Cuomo, is the shining example of these qualities. As his daughter, I see his values up close and on a personal level. I understand his goals and morals. Through hearing his plan of action and seeing what he has done in the past, and most importantly, knowing his love and compassion for the people of New York, I know that he will do great things for this state. My father has proven that he can get things done for the people. In the federal government with Bill Clinton and as Attorney General, he fights the good fight and he wins. My father not only has proven what he can do, but he has a plan for the future, future, which will be cleaning up Albany and getting the state's finances in order. I think the reason my father works as hard as he does is because he loves New York. It is his home and he wants it to be my home. He wants me to stay in New York and he wants New York to be as good or better than it was for him. My dad is smart. He works hard and he works for the people. He will always be on your side. It is my pleasure to introduce the next governor of New York with your help, Andrew Cuomo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How about that introduction? Tell the truth. Was she great? Let me, if I might, also introduce my two other young ladies who are with me today. First, my baby, Michaela. Stand up, Michaela. She doesn't like to be called a baby. She's 12 years old now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, and Cara, my 15-year-old. Stand up, Cara, please. We are just finishing, actually, what we call the combination trip. It was a combination, a little sightseeing New York, a little watch dad drive the RV and hold our <laughs> breath, and a little let's get dad elected governor trip. We put all those things together. Uh, this is actually our last stop. We're going to go to Buffalo and we're going to fly down uh, to New York City now. But I'll tell you, it was, you know, you take for granted in this state uh, what a gift we really have. And we just spent eight days about, and we were, did the mid-Hudson, the whole Hudson Valley, all through the Adirondacks, all through the Finger Lakes, all through the Southern Tier. 
It is, Stan, you're exactly right. It is, it is breathtakingly beautiful. And we have everything in this state. We really do. Anything you would want anywhere we have right here in New York. So it's a little bittersweet now that this is our last stop. It's a pleasure to be in Jamestown. Uh, I, wish, I wish the trip was continuing, but we're going to be back. Mayor Teresi, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your support. And thank you for your leadership. You're doing a great job, and we all owe you a debt of gratitude. Let's give a round of applause for Mayor Teresi. Governor Stan Lundeen, you hear Mariah said Governor Stan Lundeen. That's the appropriate protocol. Lieutenant Governor is referred to as Governor. Governor Stan Lundeen. Um, Stan Lundeen served as Lieutenant Governor to a fellow named Mario Cuomo. Cuomo, I'm sorry. For a lot of years. And he is truly a superb, superb public official. You know that from Jamestown and from the Congress, but. Watching him as lieutenant governor, he was extraordinary. Uh, and he and my father were a dynamic duo together. They were people of integrity. They were people of competence, people of principle. Uh, and they made the state work. And they made the state government work. And I learned a lot watching Stan. And it's a pleasure to be with him again. And Stan, it's an honor. Stan Lundy. And let me thank the Robert Jackson Center for their hospitality and all their good work. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> let me tell you what the drive for a new New York is all about. Stan said it right off the bat. This state, frankly, is in serious trouble. And it's in a dangerous place. And depending on what we do now, and how we handle these next few months, I believe, is going to determine what the future of the state is. Either we're going to get our act together, or we will see other states start to pass us by. I believe it's that perilous a situation. So I believe campaigns are always important, and electoral decisions are always important, but I believe this one is critical. There are a lot of chips on the table, so to speak. We're going to have to clean up that government, and we're going to have to clean up Albany to make the government work if we want to see this future have the future that we all expect it to be. Cleaning up Albany means what? It means fundamentally restoring trust in government. The one thing I hear now from one end of the state to the other, people don't even talk about the dysfunction of Albany anymore. They don't talk about the lateness anymore. What they say is, I don't trust my government. I don't trust my government. And what a damning commentary when you think about it. I don't trust my government. They don't have faith in the government. And that is damning because every relationship is about trust. No relationship works without trust. Re relationship between two people doesn't work without trust. Certainly the relationship between a government and its citizens doesn't work without trust. And the trust is gone. And that's what we have to restore. And we're not going to do it with a speech. You're not going to get up and explain to the people why they're wrong. They should really trust the state government. Because they're not wrong. Because they're right. Because the people have been disappointed. The people have been betrayed. The government was supposed to represent them and work for them. First of all, the government hasn't worked. It doesn't function. They don't pass laws. They don't pass the budget. They don't manage the government well. And it's not about them. The government is all too often responsive to the lobbyists, responsive to the special interest corporations, responsive to the people who make campaign contributions. But it's not about the people of the state. We're not going to restore the trust with words. We're going to restore the trust with actions by actually changing Albany and cleaning up Albany and bringing transparency to Albany and disclosure to Albany and new ethics laws and independent monitoring and financial disclosure. That's going to be the first order of business. Second of order of business is going to be getting our state's fiscal house in order, get them to balance the budget, understand the new economic realities. And that is imperative today. Last budget, as you know, was very late. 
Some people say, well, Andrew wasn't sympathetic enough with how hard it was to do the state budget. I think I'm a sympathetic person. Do you think I'm a sympathetic person? <laughs> Mariah thinks I'm a sympathetic person. Kara, do you think I'm sympathetic? Kara thinks I'm sympathetic. Michaela doesn't think I'm so sympathetic, but Michaela is unhappy with me anyway today. <laughs> I'm sympathetic that it's hard to do a budget. But on the other hand, I'm not that sympathetic. Why? Because everyone here today had to do a budget. Every family has to do a budget. Every small business has to do a budget. Everyone has to make ends meet. And I understand it's hard for the state. There's a deficit. And it was hard to close the deficit. And it was hard to make ends meet, because then you have to tell someone no. But that is the job that has to be done. And we can't be balancing the budget anymore on the backs of the taxpayers of this state. The answer cannot be we're going to raise taxes. The answer can't be that government is going to put its hand in the pocket of the taxpayer once again. The working families of New York can't afford it. And if you raise taxes on businesses, they will leave once and for all. I am convinced of it. So get the state's fiscal house in order by making the tough choices, finding the economies of scale. We just went through a decade of unprecedented government growth. The revenues were coming over the transom. The economy was running like wild. People were paying taxes. And the government grew and grew and grew. We now have stand over 1,000 agencies and authorities, or thereabouts. 1,000. Nobody's really sure because nobody really has a definitive list. I have one list, the Attorney General's office, the Controller's office has another list. But you know what it means when you don't even have a list of how many agencies you have? It means you have too many agencies. That's what it means. We have to find economies of scale and efficiencies. As Stan said, and the work he did, the Lundin Commission, we have to get property taxes down in this state. Worse than the state income tax? It's the property tax that is chasing people from their homes. I can't tell you how many people come up and they say, I can't pay the property tax and the mortgage. I have to sell the house because I just can't afford it anymore. And what's driving property taxes is the number of local governments, over 10,521 local governments, towns, villages, lighting district, water district, sewer district. You add up all those districts, that's what you're paying in your property taxes. And it's the same thing. We're going to have to find consolidations. We're going to have to find mergers. Not everyone has to have everything. How can we cooperate? How can we share equipment? How can we share workforces? So we actually reduce the cost of operation and we get those property taxes down. And this is all about creating jobs in New York. The first responsibility for the next governor of New York is to create jobs, create jobs, create jobs. How do you grow jobs? How do you keep jobs? How do you attract jobs? So that's a clean up Albany plan. But the real question, and the question I want to drive home in this campaign, is not what is the plan, but how do you do it? How do you actually change Albany? We know what has to be done. We've known for a while what has to be done. We haven't been able to do it. And that's where you come in, my friends. Because just electing a new governor is not enough. And people say to me, oh, we're going to be OK, Andrew. We're going to elect you, and you're going to do it. No, that's not enough. Just electing a person isn't enough. Just electing a governor isn't enough. That Albany is about a $130 billion budget. That's a lot of money. And there are a lot of powerful forces that are dedicated to keeping everything just the way it is. And to change that model, to change that dynamic is not going to be easy. I'll do my part. And I believe I have a contribution to make. I believe I have the experience. I've shown that government can work. But the only way we're going to do this, and the real power of a governor, is when the people of this state stand up united and demand that their government change. That's when it's going to change. Democracy does work, and people do have the power. 
and politicians do listen, but the people have to act and the people have to speak. And yes, we're angry, and yes, we're anxious, and yes, we're frustrated. But the point now is to take that frustration and channel it and do something with it. Don't just be frustrated and sit back. Don't just be frustrated and complain. Be frustrated and act on it. If we elect a new governor and the people of this state are united, we will change Albany. But that chorus has to stand up and speak with one voice, loud and clear, and they have to say, we demand change. We want a government that represents the people and not the lobbyists. We want a spending cap in the state of New York because we can't afford to spend anymore. We need a property tax cap on our local counties because we can't afford any more property tax increases. We need a real job development program because we're tired of seeing our young people leave to find jobs elsewhere. That's when you're going to see Albany stand up and take notice and act. Stan's point, we're in trouble, but Stan's point is also that this government is not what we see today. I have enough gray hair on my head to know the true story of the state government in Albany. And this recent blip that we've seen, these recent few years, this is not New York state government. This is, I don't know what this is. This is the exception to the rule. This is a, a pure blip where we are embarrassed by our own state government. The true story of New York state government is that it is the finest state government in the United States of America. You had, you had great, great talent and giants who served in the New York state government. I first went up, I wasn't much older than my daughters. My father was governor and I went up and I just watched. And you had giants who worked in all Giants on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, and they were people of honor and people of principle and people of integrity and people who showed up to work to make this state better. And it wasn't about politics, Democratic and Republican. It was about principle and how do you help this state. And sure, there were debates. Sure, there were debates. My father loved to debate. Just ask Stan. You say, good morning to my father. There was a debate. <laughs> But the debates were always about the future of the state. The debates were always about what's best for the people. It was never about them and their own personal politics. And at the end of the day, they shook hands and they did business and the state moved forward. I spent eight years in Washington with Bill Clinton. I was Secretary of HUD. I worked literally in every state in the nation. And somehow, they could figure out I was from New York when I was there. I'm not sure how they did it. But invariably, they would come up to me and they wanted to know what New York was doing. And their questions were all about New York. Why? Because New York state government was the first and the most progressive. And we dealt with the problems first, and the other states followed our model. New York state was the beacon of progressive government for states all across the nation. The federal government fo followed the model of New York. That's the story of New York state government. That's what it was, and that's what it will be. This state has everything we need to take off. The one thing it hasn't had is a government as good as its people. And we have to remember that. And we have to remember that. And we have to remember who we are. Because success starts with believing you can succeed. Believing you can succeed. And we have to believe that we can succeed in New York. And we have every reason to believe it. Past this prologue. Look at who we are. Look at what we've done. Look at what our government produced. Look at who we are as New Yorkers. Look at what this state built. Remember what the New York idea was. The New York idea that said, people from all across the globe, come here to New York. We welcome you all with our open arms. We, open you, we welcome you black, white, Italian, Irish, Jewish, Polish, it didn't matter. We welcome everyone here, and we say we're going to forge community and family from a disparate group of people. And we're not going to judge one from the other. We're going to find commonality amongst the people, rather than division. 
and we're going to believe in one another and cooperate with one another and invest it with one another. And as one succeeds, we all succeed. And we believed in the collective success. And that attitude and that spirit and that idea brought people from all across the globe and we built the greatest state in the nation. That's what we did with that idea. And that is what we are going to, we are going to do again. The drive for a new New York is all about that. Not just restoring New York to what was, but bringing New York to a level that never was. Because the mayor's points that opened us is the right point to close on. What this is all about at the end of the day is very simple. Our responsibility as parents, as fathers, as mothers, as sisters, as brothers, as citizens, leave this place a little bit better than we found it. Leave this place a little bit better than we found it. Work like heck so that the world we live, the world we leave our children, is a better world than the world that we grew up. New York is my home. New York is going to be their home. I don't want my daughters leaving New York to find their future. Their future is right here, and they're going to stay right here, and they're going to have a better, brighter future than the future I had. And that's because we're going to make New York the Empire State, and we're going to bring it to a level that it's never been. We're not just building back. We're building back bigger and stronger and brighter than ever before. Thank you and God bless you. inspiration that this state will need and with all of your help on January 1st this man is the 56th governor of New York State will be leading us in the way that this state deserves to be led. Thank you Andrew. And if you all want to stick around for a while the future governor of New York will be down. Love the opportunity to say hello and chat with you folks to continue to round out his understanding as to what's happening in this state and what he can do to serve us all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.